Aloha, you may have heard that uh, the color blue didn't exist in ancient times. It's a pretty popular article that's been popping up all over the place, and I have addressed it a couple of times before. So today we're going to address uh, the concept of the color blue not existing in, uh, back in ancient times. And then I'm also going to share a theory that I have as to how this could have physically been possible for blue not to exist in our world. So what's up to everybody in the chat? Uh, something's wrong with the computer, so I can't put your comments on the screen for some reason. I'll have to get that fixed, but it's good to see everyone. I see a lot of people showing up in the chat. How many people in the chat have heard of this, that the color blue did not exist, or at least no word for the color blue allegedly existed in ancient times? Not until modern times did the color blue start to pop up. We're going to read an article about it. And uh, I also put a, a poll in the chat. This was out of my own curiosity. I put, what color is the moon's light to you? The reason I did this is because lately I've been going outside. I've seen that the, the moon is getting much brighter, like seriously bright. But I also noticed, to me at least, the moonlight is becoming blue, or it appears to me to be more of a blue spectrum than just a white spectrum. Anyways, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that. Thought it was pretty interesting. I'll leave the poll up there for everybody. Right now, let's jump into this article. So this article represents one of many. Oftentimes, they're actually co copied and pasted word for word on the internet. But um, you can find this one at thebusinessinsider.com. And it's called, No One Could Describe the Color Blue Until Modern Times. Let's find out what the reason for that is. Now, let's see here. I'm going to skip over this boring beginning stuff. It says here, until relatively recently in human history, blue didn't exist. Not in the way that we think of it. Now, I'm going to pause and time out real quick right there. They added that part, not in the way that we think of it, okay? Um, but what they're really saying is that they can't find uh, very many references to the color blue. And so it seems like it didn't exist. The, here's the problem that I have found with people who've, who've been researching this. They want blue to have existed, right? Because it exists now. And so what we typically do in the modern age is we take everything that we accept as being a fact or everything that is modern or known in the modern world, and we apply that to the ancient world. Um, which I believe is a mistake quite often because I believe conditions were much different in the ancient world and conditions are constantly changing in this world, which means everything's constantly changing. If the only way that we can see the constant change is if that constant change quickens and it, and it increases exponentially in frequency or in power, um, or if that change is looked at um, from a higher perspective. So for example, if we only look around us in our modern age and we only we only associate things with what we've been taught through our academics and modern society, then that is the that is the lens with which we will see the ancient world and our future as well. But the ancient world is directly connected to the future world and it is also connected to our modern world. You guys hear me okay? I just want to double check everything's good. It's good to see everybody in the chat. Sorry, I can't put your comments up. I'll have to work on that. All right, so let's check out this article right here. So they say that the blue color blue didn't exist. It says how we realized, and when they say we, typically they mean academia, right? Or the modern world and what's accepted in the modern world. How we realized that blue was missing. So the color blue went missing. It says here in the Odyssey, written by Homer, uh, Homer famously describes the wine dark sea or the ocean that's the color of wine. But why wine dark? And why not deep blue or green as it usually is in our modern world today, right? In 1858, a scholar named William Gladstone, who later became the Prime Minister of Great Britain, noticed that this wasn't the only strange color description. Though the poet spends page after page describing the intricate details of clothing, armor, weaponry, facial features, animals, and more, 
His references to color are strange. Iron and sheep are violet. Honey is green. So let's pause right there. Basically, what, what they're saying is that they put a, a lot of stock into uh, certain historians of times past because they tend to stand upon those people's shoulders to, um, to build upon their theories and ideas that work for them so that they can cherry pick uh, into the modern age. One of the problems is, is when they come face to face with these anomalies from these academic giants whose, stole their, whose shoulders they stand upon, when they come across the anomalies, then they begin to make excuses for those anomalies saying, well, he was right about all of this, but that weird anomalous thing, that was uh, symbolic. That was a metaphor. That was this and that. Instead of trying to figure out the reality that that person um, meant it in a very matter of fact kind of a way. So they describe iron and sheep as being violet. Keep that in mind. Honey is being green, which is really interesting. Uh, the, the color of honey can change depending on the color of the pollen and a few other things. So we're going to talk about some ideas here in just a minute, but let's finish this article. So Gladstone decided to count the color references in the book. This is from the book, uh, The Odyssey, written by Homer. So he's counting up the color references. And while black is mentioned almost 200 times and white about 100 times, other colors are rare. That's interesting. Red is mentioned fewer than 15 times and yellow and green fewer than 10. Gladstone started looking at other Greek, ancient Greek texts and he noticed the same thing. There was never anything described as blue. The word didn't even exist. Now, time out real quick. Pause it. Thanks for letting me know about the, the volume to everybody in the chat. Appreciate it. All right. So check this out. What most people, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm, I'm just, I studied this a bunch. And what, what many people commonly are starting to accept and to say is that because they didn't have a word for the color blue, that their mind could not perceive the color blue. That because they didn't have a word to describe it, that it literally actually became invisible to those people. I don't buy that. If they didn't have a word for moon, they would still describe what we know as the moon. You know what I mean? Like uh, not having a word for something um, does not render it invisible in my book. That's just me. I understand people have their, uh, you know, their own beliefs and that's fine. But I don't buy that. I believe that they didn't mention blue because they didn't see blue. There was no blue. I'll explain that in a bit. Let's continue on. It says, it seemed that the Greeks lived in a murky and muddy world. That's interesting. If you put that through the lens of the plasma apocalypse, after the world goes through the depressurization and starts shaking everywhere, causes liquefaction, which makes the world muddy, boggy, swampy. The Greeks lived in a murky and muddy world, devoid of color. Can you imagine the world being devoid of color? It's difficult to imagine because we have that lens of the modern world where we have a certain atmosphere and certain light uh, and a light spectrum that we're used to. Mostly black and white and metallic with occasional flashes of red or yellow. So in the ancient Greek world, they're saying that the Greeks mostly saw things in terms of black and white with occasional descriptions of a red hue or a yellow hue. Keep that in mind. Gladstone thought this was perhaps something unique to the Greeks, but a philologist named Lazarus Geiger followed up on his work and noticed that this was true across cultures. The same thing was found. The color blue was a rare find if they could find it at all in many references worldwide across literature. He studied Icelandic sages, the Quran, ancient Chinese stories, and even an ancient Hebrew version of the Bible. Of Hindu Vedic hymns, he wrote, These hymns more than 10,000 lines long are brimming with descriptions of the heavens. Scarcely any subject is evoked more frequently than that of the heavens. 
The sun and reddening dawn's play of color, day and night, cloud and lightning, the air and the ether, all of these are unfolded before us again and again. But there's one thing no one would ever learn, that the sky is blue. Now you notice that. How could, how could ancient people learn what color the sky is? Because that's a modern usage. They're saying the sky is blue, meaning the sky is blue today. But what they're doing is they're missing something. They're, 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 they're taking the modern world and projecting it onto the ancient world, which we should not do. We would be remiss to do that. The reason that the ancients would not learn that today's sky is blue is because they forgot about their past and their history. If they would have learned and remembered their past and their history, they would notice the cycles and the patterns of the sky changing colors, which we'll get to in a bit. <coughs> Pardon me. They say, there was no blue, not in the way that we know the color. Okay, interesting. It wasn't distinguished from green or darker shades. And he looked to see when blue started to appear in languages and found an odd pattern all over the world. Every language first had a word for black and for white. A black and white world. Or dark and light, essentially. Maybe not the colors black and white, but things that were dark and things that were light. The next word for a color to come into existence in every language studied around the world was red. The color of blood and wine. Interesting. So not only was the color blue, in essence, missing from the historic record, in all of these ancient scriptures and writings. But the color red was the first to pop up across the board. People saw red. After red, historically, yellow appears. Okay, so at first people saw sort of monochrome in shades of light and dark. Then they started to see in shades of red. Then they saw red and yellows. And later, green though in a couple of languages, yellow and green switch places. The last of these colors to appear in every language is blue. The only ancient culture to develop a word for blue was the Egyptians. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's them giving their opinion on it. I'm not sure about the veracity of it or whatnot, but I take it with a grain of salt because there's much more important information in the article. So, no, no, I'm not debating, basically, over who first invented the word blue. And as it happens, they were also the only culture that had a way to produce a blue dye. I also would raise my eyebrow at that speculation. I've heard the rumors about blue dye and how it was so difficult to make. Uh, I don't know about that. I'm pretty sure it's, it's not too difficult to make blue, let alone a blue dye. But that's just me. If you think about it, blue doesn't appear much in nature, they say. Well, we're going to pause. I'm actually going to stop reading the rest of this article because this is the main focus that I wanted to, to present to you and to share with you. Um, because they start talking about things like blue doesn't really appear in nature. I believe that it does, actually, quite often. Um, maybe not as prolific as other things, but it does appear quite often from time to time. We see blue all over the place. So let's talk about this. How could, let's say that it was all literal. Let's say that it was all physical and actual and factual. And let's just assume that the reason why, just for a moment, right? Just to play with our imaginations. Let's assume that the reason why the people did not have the color blue or that that particular color was introduced last, historically speaking, is because the color did not exist. It was not in the world as we know it. We could not, mankind, humankind, <clears throat> could not see blue because it wasn't there. So how could that be possible? How could a world be lacking blue? Well, it depends on the color spectrum, right? The reason that we have the colors that we see now, which by the way, have become more and more over time, you may have noticed. The reason is because of the color spectrum. Let's take a look at the color spectrum. There you go. All right, so here's the color spectrum. Way over here is red, the first color to have been 
popular, basically, after black and white, we could say. And then they say it went into the yellow spectrum. Well, that's right next door to red. Then they say green was introduced. Ah, that's right next door to yellow. And then finally blue. Isn't that something, right? That's where we, that's where we are now. We have the blue color. So let's talk about a theory. Let's talk about different types of light sources and how our world goes through different types of lighting. In the last few live streams, we've discussed the moon, the multiple moons, the various suns that were said to have existed from culture to culture uh, worldwide across time. People have myths and legends, history, historic accounts, and writings about multiple light sources that are not only and solely from that focal point that we call the sun today or the uh, the projection, the projected image that we see at night called the moon, the focal point and the projected image. That's what we have today. However, that was not always so, not according to the ancients. The ancients, as a matter of fact, uh, knew that there was more than just the sun and the moon up in the sky and that other heavenly bodies were larger and closer and provided different types of light sources. So check this out. If we change the light source, and we make it other than the ones that we have now, we will change, or the colors will change in our world. All of them. Color is dependent upon the source of light that is uh, reflected off of pigmentation and, and some other stuff. But it all depends on the type of light that reflects off of an object. So all that needs to, be, to have been done in the ancient world is for there to have been alternative light sources or a change in the current light source. That's not too far of a leap for us to, to jump to that conclusion because there's plenty of evidence that points to it, right? Let's look at one possible option. This is called the sodium vapor lamp. See that right above my shoulder there? This is the color of the sodium vapor lamp. Now, there's two types of sodium vapor lamps, and I'm going to explain these because I feel like they may play an important role in our our forgotten history. Now, this sort of gives off an amber glow to it, which immediately reminds me of uh, the, the song Amber, <laughs> which is like one of my favorite songs, but I think that it, it's also esoterically describing an ancient sky and one to come, known as the Golden Age. As you can see, the light right behind me is a golden color. This is called a high pressure sodium vapor lamp. There's two types. There's the low pressure sodium vapor lamps and there's the high pressure sodium vapor lamps. It says here, a sodium vapor lamp, sodium vapor. So sodium is salt essentially. And then vapor is mist. Hmm. Okay. Keep that in mind. So a sodium vapor lamp is a gas discharge lamp that uses sodium in an excited state to produce light. Sodium in an, in an excited state means electrified. It means ionized. That's what it means. So what we have here is a salt mist or a salt fog, essentially, I'm simplifying it, that has become electrified. And because it does such, it turns into um, a type of plasma, basically. Two varieties of such lamps exist, low pressure and high pressure. Some of you might already know where I'm going with this. Low pressure sodium lamps are highly efficient electrical light sources, but their yellow light restricts applications uh, to outdoor lighting, such as street lamps where they are widely used. High pressure sodium lamps emit, watch this, a broader spectrum of light. Remember that. You increase the pressure in these lamps, you increase the spectrum of light, and therefore the number of colors that can be seen. High pressure sodium lamps emit a broader spectrum of light than the low pressure lamps, but they still have poorer color rendering than other types of lamps. Low pressure sodium lamps uh, only give monochromatic yellow light and so inhibit color vision at night. What does that mean in English? <laughs> In simple terms, that means if you have a low pressure sodium lamp, the light that shines everywhere will be one color. Everything you look at will be a shade of only one color, which is usually this uh, dull golden kind of a yellow color because that's the color that the sodium 
turns when you ionize it, basically. All right, so let's go from here and let's build another bridge. Let's make another connection, right? Here is the groundwork, the simple version of how they make a low pressure sodium lamp. We're going to start with low pressure and then move into the high pressure. Now on the inside, you've got a cathode and an anode, respectively. And um, between them, an electrical arc is formed. That electrical arc is what excites the sodium vapor, basically, that is all around it. And it ionizes it and brings about the color that it changes. So you have an anode and a cathode acting together as an arc. Now, if we take this information and apply it to the ancient world, um, and for those of you who might not be familiar with Mount Maru or the North Pole, the true North Pole lands that were once there on ancient maps, buckle your seatbelt because uh, you're going to get a crash course. So right here I have, uh, this is one of my favorite websites to look at ancient maps. It's called the David Rumsey Map Collection. And I have typed in Urbano Monti. Urbano Monti, this is one of his maps. This is the map of the world. Very interesting because you can see uh, Antarctica or what is known as Antarctica, the ring around our world, does, ha does not have any ice on it, on this map. There's a lot of anomalies on this map, and it's very interesting. It was made in uh, about the 1500s, I believe. But something of interest to myself is that the land on the North Pole is prominent. Let's zoom in. As you can see, tradition, myths and legends, religion, all say that this land was separated by four rivers, which means there were four island masses or small continents at the middle of our world at the North Pole. Now, some people are aware of this, but if we go a little bit further, we see that at the very middle, right here where this upside down letter G is, which stands for Gimel, which infers that it means uh, a destination. It's the ancient letter for a foot that is moving or a leg that is walking. So it implies a destination, which is right here in the middle of the world. This is where it is said that Mount Maru is, the magnetic mountain, the black mountain, Rupas Nigra, the mountain which the compasses of our, of our world point towards. And there is a lake, a crystal lake, a crystal clear lake, I should say, surrounding that volcanic mountain island at the dead center of the world. And I call this the plasma volcano because every other cycle, our world goes through an electromagnetic reversal. When we go through the next one, right now the energy is being sucked down into the earth and it, all the energy is receding down into the inner recesses of our world, into uh, the hollow recesses of our world. When we go through an electromagnetic reversal, the energy will fluctuate outwards and it will disperse coming up to the surface world where we live. Now, any area where it comes up out of any cavernous opening will um, spout forth a fountain of light or a fountain of plasma. Jupiter 21. Hey, good to see you. Welcome. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm so serious right now, but I'm just like in the zone in my head. Um, so any place where there are inner earth entrances that lead down into the hollow recesses of our world, uh, the light, the plasma from inside the world will find its way out. And thus it will create a sky beam or a beam of light that shoots up into the heavens where the largest openings are. You will have the tallest sky beams. The one right here in the middle would be the tallest of all of them. Now this tallest sky beam is said to have two witnesses on either side to create an electrical arc. So, if we use this map in particular, and I have started to find these on other maps as well, and I encourage you to do so if you're interested in doing some online exploration with me, we can find that the Earth has an anode and a cathode. It has a positive and a negative at the site where this main electrical beam shoots up into the sky, which is right here in the middle. So on either side flanking this magnetic mountain, we should find another magnetic mountain that does the same. One that shoots a positive and the other that shoots a negative, possibly. Now, let's look directly up and across. You see this little dot right there, this little triangle? We're gonna bring this into view. We're gonna zoom in on it. I've shown this a few times before. It's upside down, but it says uh, magnetic North Pole. 
Interesting, right? It's not at the exact center of the world. This is north, and this is magnetic north. This is where Rupus nigra is, right? Now, that would act as an anode or a cathode. As you can see, it's drawn like a mountain that has a hole in it, or a cave, or it's a volcano, basically, right? A plasma volcano. Now, if we go exact opposite of that, we should find its counterpart. We should find the anode or cathode version uh, that complements it. So let's go down across. And what do we see right here? It's another gigantic mountain. And the words are kind of uh, faded from it, but this one also says magnet, uh, magnetic pole. The reason that they're called poles is because poles literally, or actually, I should say, and literally, okay, because it is written, the poles shoot out of these mountains. The beams of light, the columns of light shoot out of these mountains. This is why they're known as poles, because they create actual poles that you can see, columns of light, pillars of light that reach up into the heavens and touch the sky. So here's one on one side. Here's the middle, or the neutral, you could call it. And here's the other one, one acting as an anode, one acting as a cathode. And I also want to throw this out there. I have a feeling, I can see that there are two on this map. But I had a feeling that there were two others. So I'm working on this one right now, but I'll just give you a sneak preview. I went back to this map to see if I can find one on this side and one on this side. So I zoomed in and I'm like immediately drawn to this little object right here. And I'm like, isn't that something? What in the world do we have here? Right? This looks almost like the other one that they drew. Another steep mountainous cliff jutting up out of the ocean waters. It has to jut up out of the ocean waters, just like this one, and just like this one over here, and just like Mount Maru in the middle. Why? Because if this is um, electrolysis in our world, if our world is electrically ran, then it would have an electro. Then it stands to reason that it's possible that it could have a type of electrolysis system in place that would that would give us plenty of benefits to the world that we live in. Um, in an, in an electrolyte type of an environment, you have to have the electrolyte, which is salt water. So the salt water acts as the medium between these things. Now, when these beams shoot up into the sky, they naturally arc over towards one another, creating the legs of the so-called squatterman glyph that is seen on caves and rocks and stuff from times past, right? And then you have this, the body of the stick figure, which is the beam of plasma shooting up from Mount Maru up into the heavens, the, the biggest beam of all. The other two make an electrical arc connecting. That central beam separates those two into male and female, respectively. And this is also your Adam and Eve story, or one possible interpretation of it. And uh, these beams shoot up into the sky. So what does that mean and how does that relate to blue and the color blue? Let's make a connection, right? We talked about how the sodium vapor lamps make this color, this golden age, amber looking color, right? And the way that it makes that is you have to have sodium vapor. Okay, let's go back to our map. Everything around this is essentially sodium vapor. It's salt water. Okay, I mean, not, not vapor. Um, it's salt water. It's sodium water. Okay, it's actually NaCl, uh, but sodium's in there. Okay, so it's salt water. Now, all we need is to turn that ocean water or that salt water, which acts as the electrolyte for our world, for the, for the electricity at the top of the world. All we need to do is turn that into vapor. Interesting, because there's a direct correlation with vapor and a vapor canopy that envelops our world uh, every cycle, whenever the world depressurizes. Vapor instantly uh, um, is seen everywhere. During the worldwide depressurization that we go through, our atmosphere is pulled apart. And when it's ripped apart so quickly like that, the air itself turns into fog and into mist. Now, if we have... In addition to that, try to follow me with this just for a moment. The world depressurizes. When the world depressurizes, Archimedes' principle states that however much uh, fluid is displaced will be equal to a, a new buoyant force that pushes up from underneath. What does that mean? That means zero gravity. That means floating. Whatever you'd like to call it, that means an increased buoyancy factor uh, for a short time as, as the sky is exploding outward. That means that we all start to flow up because the buoyancy overcomes our density. 
That also means that the salt water that, it, that we need in order to create a worldwide sodium vapor lamp to get this beautiful color, the salt water will go up into the air. The oceans, all, all of the world's water supply will float freely up into the air and be electrified by all of the electricity that is coming down and wrapping, wrapping around our world at the, at the present moment, known as the plasmosphere. That will be free to come in because the electromagnetic field of our world will hit a neutral point and it will go down and no longer protect us from that plasma from above. The plasma comes in and excites, to, to quote the article, excites the new, the new uh, sodium uh, water supply, basically, and um, that mixes with the, the vapor canopy, giving us sodium vapor. Okay, let's see here. Sodium vapor lamp is a gas discharge lamp uh, that uses sodium in an excited state. Well, we have all of that so far on a large grand scale of our world. Oh, I just got a donation. Hold on, let me give a shout out. A flat earth Norseman just gave me 20 bucks and says, you constantly challenge my 70s and 80s toasted gray matter. Oh man, that's cool. Good. I'm glad. Thank you. And thanks for the support. All right. So sodium vapor lamp. Now there's two types. There's a low pressure and there's a high pressure right? <clears throat> Let me show you some examples here. All right. So this is i I'm going to show you an example from this YouTube channel I found called Edison Tech Center. I'm going to play it in super slow motion. I have the volume turned off, but I want to show you an example of what happens. This right here, imagine this is our world, this little glass tubing. Just imagine that that's the firmament or that's the sky. Okay. Now we go through worldwide rapid depressurization. The sky expands creating instant vapor or mist or fog all over the place, right? The oceans or salt water go up and mix with it all. And then on top of everything, we have huge electrical discharges that excite said salt water, sometimes even pulling apart uh, the chemicals, um, uh, the sodium and the chloride, basically. Now, the chloride is a whole different story because it's going to create chlorine and some other stuff too, but we're going to focus on the sodium for right now because that's what we need in order to recreate this. So imagine that this is the world that we live in, right? Everything has been depressurized, so now we are in a low-pressure environment, exactly like in this lamp that you're about to see. It says low-pressure sodium lamp right here, actually. I don't know if you can read that, but it's a low pressure sodium lamp. So this matches on a microscopic scale that of our world during the creation period or the recreation period. So let's go ahead and start it up real quick. Boom. I'm going to pause it right there. The second that, that the, uh, that the, what do you call it? Uh, atmosphere within that enclosed system, which is represented by the light bulb. The second that it lights up, um, certain elements are starting to become ignited first. The, everything goes in its order, right? And whenever these elements are ignited first, you can see that there is a purple glow. Let's see if I could catch it. You see that right there? So instantly, it, there's a purple flash, okay? And if you imagine and apply this to our ancient past and to the anode and the cathode on each side of the Garden of Eden or the land at the North Pole, as we pointed out, this would be expected to be replicated on a worldwide scale, that the sky itself and all light would be purple for a short time. Now, because this is a tiny example, right, then the time that we would experience it would be lengthened. Okay, so anything that is on, on a small scale, right? If we apply it to a worldwide scale, then we have to increase the amount of time. So the amount of time that you see the purple light in this is almost instantaneous. It only lasts for like a second. But if you blow this up onto the worldwide scale, this would last for quite some time. Now, let's watch what happens to the light as it starts to electrify its own atmosphere. Watch the color changes, right? Now imagine this is the light source that is coming up from the North Pole itself, right? It's igniting our sky. It's igniting the elements and the chemicals that are in uh, the vapor canopy that is now enveloping our world, right? So I'm showing you, you can clearly see, I think this is at two times the speed too. Let me just double check. Oh no, this is actually super slow right now. So I've got it on super slow speed. I'm going to, I'm going to put it super fast so that it's easier to see the color change. Now check this out. You see how it goes to a deep red like that? Imagine that that happens 
in our ancient past to our world, that our world goes through color spectrums. Right now, we live under a white light, which has a broad color spectrum. But if the sky itself changes color and turns red, every single thing will reflect that monochromatic red tone or overtones. Now, take a look at this. If we fast forward a bit, and we allow it to continue its progress, it naturally starts to go from the red color to this golden color. This ushers in the golden age, right? We start off the first color out of the darkness. It always starts with darkness, but the first color is, um, is, a, is a purple, right? So we have a purple dawn. We have a purple dawn color in our world. The next color that it goes to is a deep red color. Wait a minute, this is starting to fit the ancient descriptions, right? At the very beginning, people saw in a monochromatic tone. That means one color and one color only. Basically, they saw in shades of something that is lightly colored or darkly colored, right? And if you only have one color, then it, 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 it's not really a color in and of itself. It just is. You know what I mean? So you wouldn't see, you wouldn't call it red if red was all you knew. You would just call it light. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But anyways, uh, so this is how the people of the world this is how the light source would have been reflected. Another interesting thing about these sodium vapor lamps is one of the reasons that they are used and still put into use worldwide is because of their ability to split the fog. The light has a better um, path through mist and fog. And if our world is enveloped in a, what's known as a vapor canopy or, um, or vaporous mist-like fog conditions or whatever because of the rapid depressurization, then this type of a light would be the best type of a light for any beings that live inside of it, which sounds like it was purposefully done that way, right? For our benefit. All right, so it starts off into the red spectrum. And then after it burns for a while, it goes more into like this color, into this golden, yellow, orangey sort of a color. It's going through its own color spectrums. Now keep in mind, as it heats up, it turns yellow. Keep in mind, oh wow, here's, here's what it looks like super bright. Look at that. Now this color is what it would go through. Eventually you would have it change into the super bright yellow color, which reminded me of um, the back rooms. Remember when we did uh, that, that creepy pasta the backrooms episode and I was explaining the symbolism that we all tap into collectively when we think that we're just making up these random stories called the backrooms, how the first room of the backrooms was this monochromatic yellow color that was seen everywhere. And there were monsters, right? Because when the world goes through this next depressurization, uh, the sky opens up, allowing for monsters and creatures, otherworldly creatures, to float down into our world and for monsters and otherworldly creatures to rise up from below as well, giving us a real life edition of the backrooms so that, that we thought was just fantasy and made up. All right. So anyways, this is a low pressure sodium lamp, right? What happens when we increase the pressure though? If this is akin to our world and we can compare this to uh, to the ancient world, right? The pressure is released, so that's the least amount of pressure immediately after that when, it, when the electromagnetic dome goes back up after the, after the polarity shift, right? That dome goes back up, which means the pressure will immediately start to build slowly over time. And the more pressure that builds, the more it's going to change the light source color. Now other items will look different under this kind of light. So other, other colors will, will look different. It's monochromatic. So if you shine this monochromatic light at green, it's not going to look green. If you shine it at blue, it's not going to look blue. As a matter of fact, anything that has, um, there are, there are certain colors that will pretty much just turn black. Blue is one of them that turns black under this type of a red or yellow spectrum, basically. So there are these stories of these angels death angels, I guess you could call them these angels of the Lord in the, in the Bible, the grim reaper is seen as this, um, black figure that sort of hovers through and he's got his, uh, you know, his weapon with him or whatever. And, and he is responsible for killing people and stuff. There are the death eaters. There's the Harry Potter. I forgot what they're called, but I don't know if those were the death eaters, but there's those black creatures, right? Well, if we take a look the Action Lab has been doing some really cool videos and some experiments with these sodium vapor lamps. Here, you can see that he created plasma and then turns on the sodium vapor lamp, sodium vapor lamp 
to see what color it turns. This, because it's because of the heat source, you could do this with fire as well, turns black. So let's say our world had this monochromatic yellow tone to it because essentially we have changed our light source and now we live under the conditions of a worldwide sodium vapor lamp, right? Heat sources, and especially those that are hot plasmas or fire, would look black or look like black spirits that are going throughout the towns or, you know, wherever you might see this or something, right? Now, here is an article. This is from the Health Hazard Evaluation Report that Boeing did. And they were talking about the effects of low-pressure sodium vapor lamps. And I found something very interesting here. It says a recent study reported a slight increase in body and adrenal gland weight in the female rats that were exposed to the sodium vapor lights or lamps. So along with this type of a light source, it kicks in ancient memories and unlocks things in our DNA. And we physically start to adapt and change because the body knows already what's coming. We might not remember in the short term, but we have uh, what I call spirit memory, first and foremost. And then secondly, we have um, collective, uh, collective memory that, that is locked into our DNA and our genetics, right? That is passed down and it is stored away for when we need it. That causes changes in us. One of those changes, it says, is a larger adrenal gland. Interesting. Why would the body automatically just be like, wow, we need way more adrenaline Look at the yellow lights, look at the orange lights, look at the red lights, pump up the adrenaline quick, right? Well, because when you see the lights turn red, that's the danger time, right? That's why when we have emergencies, all the lights turn red or whatever. It's, it's because when the lights of our world, when our sky turns red, that's when there's a lot of danger. That's when the apocalypse, the apocalypse has just happened. And when otherworldly creatures that might eat you, sting you, torment you, kidnap you, who knows, enter and fall down into our world and we need to be on high alert. So the adrenal gland grows bigger. Interesting. Here's the color spectrum as well. So as you can see, it's, it's in the perfect order that history shows it. First, people started describing the color red right? Mostly black and white because that's all how they saw. If all they had was red, then they would just describe things in shades of light and dark, right? Which means that we once lived, if this is true, we once lived in a black and white world, which all of a sudden gives credence to the little breadcrumbs of truth that are dropped to us in movies where the movies start off in black and white and it's all just black and white but then something starts to happen and the and some character starts to change and then a little color is introduced and then a little co more color is introduced and then other colors are starting to be introduced we see that in our pop culture and perhaps it's because we're starting to unlock just before these these times right around the corner we're starting to um unlock secret and ancient knowledge through our collective subconscious in the form of entertainment and the arts, we could say. So people started to see red. That was the first one right around the time that yellow was introduced because now they have another color to compare red to. So now they can name the light instead of just saying it's light and dark. Now they can put a name to it because they have something to compare it with, which is the next color, which is the yellow spectrum. And then after that, green was introduced. And then after that, blue. Now let's go back to this story and double check what we have here. Now they said that Homer was describing various items, right? Uh, oh, I just got a donation, 20 bucks from Lor Loredana Therese or Lore. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate you. Um, so let's go back here real quick. Uh, let's see. It says he described... Ah, let's start with the wine dark sea. Let's go back to the beginning, right? So it says that Homer described the ocean basically as being wine dark, right? Now, imagine that you live under that monochromatic, low pressure sodium lamp type of a world, type of an environment, right? And that's the color of the sky is, is red along the red spectrum, right? Um, the water, right? It, it would turn, it would, um, man, how do I describe this? Sorry, it's not my forte. But basically, uh, the water would look black and the surface would reflect whatever color was above it, which is red. So the, you would have black water 
that has a, 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 re, a red reflective surface, surface, which is why it was described as being wine dark and not a blue ocean or a green ocean or anything along those lines because the world may have actually been red at some point in time. So he describes the seas as being wine dark, meaning purpley or red in color, which is the two colors that we start off in the sodium vapor lamp uh, conditions. And then they go on to say that there was really strange descriptions of iron and sheep, that they were violet. Well, those things would also reflect the color that is around them, right? Uh, especially sheep being white, anything white. If you've put on a white t-shirt and you go into a place that has black lights, which is actually just purple light, right? What color does your t-shirt turn? What color are the sheep going to turn? They didn't actually, the, sh the sheep may not have actually been purple because that would, that would be interesting and strange. And we'd have to figure out why they just looked purple because that was the pigment that was reflected back from their white fur or whatnot, right? Under like a black light. And the black light was basically, um, uh, the blue, the blue beam shooting up and then the red, right? And then the sky gets excited and turns red and orange and stuff too. But you have the blue beam meeting that red hole in the sky where the, where the world depressurized and all that red plasma is coming down together, giving you a purple color, which means that it's very likely that the sheep would have looked purple or violet. Honey was seen as being green. Now, this is really interesting to me. There's a few different ways that this could happen, but um, that's not really a complete anomaly to the modern world. We do have green honey in the modern world. Um, it depends on the color of the pollen that is collected. So if some sort of worldwide event happens that jumpstarts plant life and, and, and provides con new conditions, atmospheric conditions, especially in a new light source and a new type of light source, the, the way that the plants grow, they will respond instantaneously. All plant life in the world will respond to this new type of light source. Now, this sp specific type of light source is very beneficial to plant life and can even cause them to bloom in different ways sooner, more, and to grow to larger sizes as well. So that could actually produce a different type of pollen that might be a different color. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that the colors will change. The color spectrum will change. And if this is true, anything that, we, that has a blue pigment to it would not have been seen as being blue in the ancient world under a red sky. It would have been black. And then over time, as that spectrum opened up a little bit more, you would see that black color go more into like a green color because that's what's next on that color chart, right? Where is that color chart? All right, so, so the blue items, right, when the spectrum grows, they would start to look more uh, green. And whenever the spectrum opens up even wider, they would start to look more their true blue color. All right, let's go back to this uh, thing here. So it says they didn't have a word for blue. Everything started off with occasional flashes of red or yellow, which is exactly what we see if we follow suit with the sodium vapor lamps, as we talked about. And, oh, this is a cool map. Okay, so just a side note, I found this while I was researching, but here's another interesting map of the North Pole. This one looks like a fan. If I zoom out, it's kind of fanned out like that. But if you zoom into the middle, they have the lands at the North Pole right there. <laughs> they have these little four islands right there. Here's one, two, three, four. And then if you look even closer, you can see that it looks like maybe they split the plasma volcano in half. That here's half of it, Mount Maru right here on this side. And here's the other half on this side uh, at the exact 90 degree marker, which they usually put something in the way so you can't see what's truly at the middle there. They always put some sort of a divider or something. But anyways, I thought that was pretty interesting too. So what do you guys think? I'm back in the chat now. That was kind of my presentation. So basically in a nutshell, the theory that I have is that the reason that the color blue was not described was not because that they weren't smart enough to come up with a a descriptor. <laughs> That's so ridiculous, right? Mainstream academics basically conditions us to believe that the further back in time we go, the dumber we were. I don't hold to that theory. I have a feeling that the opposite of that is actually true. And today we are a dumbed down society and that our ancestors were quite intelligent and that they were closer um, in their relationship to the world. And therefore they understood a lot more things, which is good news because if that is the way things once were, 
and things are cyclical and follow the law of cycles, that is the way things will once be again. That's what's right around the corner in our future. This is why it's so interesting for me to study things like the past and to, um, you know, to research and and follow small scale experimentation so that we can apply it on a worldwide scale to figure out the conditions changing in our world. And the conditions are always changing in our world. That light source is not one steady, constant color. It changes day to day by a little fraction of a degree. But if we don't consider it, we just get used to it and we don't, we don't notice those changes. Just like uh, the, old, uh, the old saying that if you put a frog into a pot of you know, warm water or whatever, and then you put that pot on, onto the stove and you start to slowly heat it up, the frog will become used to that gradual increase. It won't even notice it. The same thing could be said and applied to us in our perception of the world around us. The world around us is gradually and constantly and always changing, including light sources, including uh, energy, energetic fluxes and fluctuations in frequency, etc. It is always changing. It must if it follows uh, un various universal laws. It's constantly in flux, constantly changing and shifting from one extreme to the other extreme, right? All right, cool. Well, that was pretty much my presentation of uh, my theory on why the color blue did not exist. Not that we didn't have a word for it. Not that people were too dumb to describe it. Not that it was invisible to them because uh, they never heard of the word blue, so they couldn't see it, which is the most ridiculous explanation I've ever heard of. But because blue did not exist because we had a different light source, because the sky itself was red. And if you look up the history of the color of the sun itself, the further back into, right now it's white with, a, with a, a little hint of blue, I would say, with a little hint of blue, right? That's just me. But the sun is blindingly white. You go back a little bit in time, the sun was yellow. And many of you can remember and attest to this as witnesses that the sun was yellow not too long ago, as was the moon. The moon was thought of as being cheese and made of cheese, right? Which is typically we associate that with a yellow color. Or even if you go further back in time, green cheese. The moon was seen as being green cheese. It started off as green cheese, but once the moon wasn't green any longer and it was yellow, then they were like, oh, well, it must be yellow cheese. Now the moon has turned white. So now people will say, oh, it must be white cheese. You know what I mean? The conditions are changing, so is the way that we look at things. Belinda just gave me a $10 donation. I wish I could put it up. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Belinda. She says, super interesting. I appreciate your research and insight. You're very welcome. It's an honor and it's fun. It's a lot of fun, actually. Um, so yes, uh, the sun, as, you, as many of you can remember, if you go back in time, it, it was more yellow. And your grandparents would remember it being more orange. And their grandparents would remember it being more red. And as a matter of fact, if you go very far back in time, many, many, many depictions of the ancient sun that I have looked up are pure red. Look at the Japanese flag. Look at many different flags that have the sun symbolized on, on them, right? That were started hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It doesn't have a white circle for the sun like we do today on their flags. It's red. Because that's the color that the sun was, right? Um, which is really interesting because if you know what color it was, you can predict what color it's going to change into. But I've done many videos about that. Um, that's my presentation for today. I hope that made a lot of sense for everybody. I would love to hang out in the chat, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go uh, do some more research on my side of things. And until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye. Dang, that was not smooth. <laughs> I, I've, I lost the button to push. All right, cool. Let's roll the credits. Hey, thanks for all your support. Please hang out and uh, enjoy the song for all these awesome people that support my channel. We'll see you soon. So hard to fade away. Actually, no. Hold on. I forgot to mention one thing. So real quick, let's just uh, rewind. I know, right? I just threw a wrench into everyone's thing. They're like, it was supposed to end.
This is different. This is weird. That's why I like my channel because I can do what I want. I can say goodbye and come right back. You never know. Anyways, <laughs> um, so the low pressure sodium vapor lamps, they turned that, that type of a, uh, an amber, golden, orange color, right? But when you increase the pressure inside of that closed system, and remember, our pressure is constantly being increased until it is released. When you increase the pressure, it increases the color spectrum, right? So with more pressure in that type of an environment, the more colors are starting to be revealed. That's why we started with one color being mostly red. I mean, in, for a short time, purple, but then it, it goes into red for a long time, right? We started with that color, but as the pressure increases and increases and increases, as it does every single day, then that color spectrum starts to widen and it starts to open, giving rise to brand new colors. So I hope, I hope, I just wanted to make that point clear as to why we have so many different colors today. We have a lot of pressure in the world today. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was pretty much it. All right, cool. Well, hey, let's run the credits. Until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye.